from Microbe TV. This is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 165, recorded on January 24, 2019. Joining me today here in a very wet New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Vincent, how are you? Fortunately, dry because we're inside. <laughs> but if you right. look out the window, no, New Jersey dark. Is, and no, cloudy. Well, actually, New Jersey came back. They're, Windy. This is called a nor'easter. It is. Also joining us remotely, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everybody. Hey there, do you have Daniel. bad weather out there? I do. And and someone was telling me it's the kind of rain that reminded them of the Forrest Gump rain concepts. I guess <laughs> apparently he has some important quote about uh, the, the four types of rain. You guys, anyone anyone know these nope. the four types I of rain? Don't. Not me. I don't. All right. I think it's the kind of the rain, the kind that makes you sick, right? <laughs> so there's so I'm gonna I'm gonna I just look this up because you know I maybe our listeners are far scum fans, but apparently there's little bitty sting and rain, there's big old fat rain, there's rain that flew in sideways, huh. and sometimes rain ever seemed to come straight up, straight up from underneath. I'll be darned. <laughs> so it sounds like a I box have, of chocolates. <laughs> well, I have to say this this rain, it's like, you know, the umbrella is useless because the rain it does. It seems like it's rising up and you just end up soaked. Yeah, yeah you do. You do. Uh, well, I have a quote I'd like to refer to everyone uh-huh. uh listening that Dixon reminded me of. It's by Ralph Waldo Emerson. The expectation of gratitude is miserable. <laughs> That's today's quote. <laughs> Let's hope it's correct. <laughs> Before we get to our case, we have a follow-up from Steve who writes, Hi, Vincent, Dixon, and Daniel. Happy New Year. Great to find a new installment so soon into the new year. I enjoyed this week's diversions into the wider mysteries of life, the universe, and everything from Dixon and Daniel's African excursions and all your twips down memory lane. Though I have to say, when you get into metabolomics and quantum computing— <laughs> I get to feel quite inadequate and as uneasy about believing mathematicians as I am with magicians and pickpockets that I can't follow either. <laughs> <laughs> and hearing again your delight with the John Updike poem, it struck me that you might not have picked up the allusion in the title to the nursery rhyme where he has replaced Jack with VB. Of course, the name of the poem is VB Nimble, VB Quick. Yeah. Sure. It might interest you to add more breath with how some other artists that you know also commandeered the Be Quick meme for their own creations. The whole <laughs> Wikipedia page on Jack Be Nimble. Mm-hmm. Apparently, saith Wiki, to jump over a lighted candlestick without putting it out was thought to be good luck and required skill, speed, and dexterity. Very fitting for the fast-working and versatile Professor Wigglesworth, I should think. Cool blue, gray, and pink tinged dawn puffy clouds here. Do you remember The Land of Gray and Pink by the Canterbury Band Caravan? The album cover will give you an idea of the sky here at the moment. You'll find some great wordplay there, too. Hmm. With the starlings and sparrows just getting up for chat and early check on the neighbor's bird tables. (laughs) All rather rather pleasantly peaceful. In fact, all the best, Steve, from Luton, England. That's a nice picture he painted. Yeah, it's quite nice. I like that cool blue, gray, and pink tinged dawn puffy clouds it's almost a little haiku if you put each one on a separate line oh dixon do you write haiku i don't i read it i don't write it all right thank you steve i thought we would start with a little follow-up for our case (laughs) highbrow (laughs) highbrow. we're about to (laughs) i've never heard of caravan have you no i have not caravan let me look it up very quickly here caravan the band um Caravan the band, an English band Caravan from the, the yeah from the Canterbury area, founded blah blah blah. <laughs> nope, don't know them. I know podcasts these days. All right, let's go to back to Twip one six four right. a few weeks ago, where Daniel gave us a, a case from Uganda. Right, Daniel? 
Yes, yes. I've been doing a little traveling lately. I just got back yesterday from uh, Scotland. Oh, how cool. Yeah, and they remembered you, Vincent. Apparently, you had been at the University of Glasgow at some some point in the past. Oh, yes, a couple of times, yeah. Most recently, uh, I went to the the new um, MRC Virology Center. Yes. Did you meet... uh, that what is there's a, a young lady who who does this blog science girl G R R L she's in Glasgow. No, but you know I actually shot them an, an email, um, not with much warning. I think like the day before I left because I remembered and I said, hey, by the way, I'm here for a few <laughs> days. Let me know if there's a science girl meeting of, of the <laughs> Glasgow science girls. I'm happy to join in if I would would be welcome. But I did not hear anything so. Uh, mm-hmm. Maybe next time, hopefully, I will be invited back. I tried to be on my best behavior there at the University of Glasgow. <laughs> uh, and I hope to be invited back because I really enjoyed Scotland. I, I don't like Haggis, but I think just about everything else I enjoyed. It's a great country. I like it too, I have to admit. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, yeah, Glasgow is a nice city it also. Is. It is. Where did, did you stay on the, on the center there in that square, that big square? So I stayed at the uh, Glasgow Grosvenor which is a little Hilton right across the street from the Botanic Gardens mm. and just a few few blocks away from the university. And I, I had the pleasure basically of hanging out with lots of uh, parasitology um, and global health aficionados. Uh, I was hosted by a Christina Nolly and then her husband, uh, Richard. Richard's actually a leash, leash maniac. I, I think it's nice when the parasites lend to uh, such descriptive um, adjectives. Um, but and I actually discussed this case a little bit while he was there. So shall we? Mm, Please. Yes. Shall we? Uh, shall we remind Let's everyone tuning it, back in and introduce <clears throat> this case to those tuning in for the first time? Um, I had brought everyone with me vicariously to eastern Uganda, to the lowlands below Mount Elgon, right on the Kenyan border, and I was. Uh, Working in a FEMRIC, Foundation International Medical Relief, um, for children clinic, seeing 100 plus children and families uh, per day. And uh, this was, as I, I said to everyone, this was a representative. Um, this was a particular individual, but something, uh, a clinical presentation that was not uncommon. A mother brought in a four year old uh, female child, uh, was there during the end of the rainy season. And the concern that the mother had for her daughter was that her daughter had had one day of fever, headache, and cough. An exam, the girl had looked ill. Uh, The exam was uh, notable for a rapid heart rate. There were crackles um, localized in the right lower lung. Um, I gave a list of potential tests that we might um, that we might do. They were limited. Uh, there were several children in this family. This is the only one who um, was ill. Uh, we gave a little background that the children, um, they're always told, you know, I know it's hot, but don't go swimming in that local stream. But they always did. And, of course. Um, they, uh, lots of animals. Uh, it's a four-year-old, and, and they already are sort of participating in things, but not not doing a lot, probably, um, as far as their jobs around. Uh, they help gather drinking water. We talked about the idea that first thing in the morning, it was uh, felt to be clean. If you could just get it first thing in the morning, the, <laughs> the water would still be clean. And, and my uh, good friend, Godfrey, who I'd walk to and from the clinic with uh, three miles every day, informed me that, though a popular belief, not true. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, said, I agree. Uh, a lot of the people, including this young gal, uh, live in homes with dirt floors, thatched roofs. Mm -hmm. And um, I did try to give people the hint that um, one of the primary issues this young girl had, probably about 30 people a day were coming into the clinic um, with this issue. Mm -hmm. All right. First guest comes from Caitlin and Carrie, who write, Dear Cantwips, which I don't get. Do you, Dixon? Daniel, do you get it? No, I don't actually. Can't, can't whips, can't whips, no. All right. We cry foul play. This could be virtually any worm short of a night crawler and any disease short of St. Vitus's dance. If I were not in Uganda, if it were not in Uganda, we would have suspect the patient to be a four-year-old female penguin 
Most unfair. Uh, Harkening back to us, <laughs> uh, you know. <laughs> I feel like they're on the right track, actually. But but okay, we'll see where this goes. Oh, did he just drop a hint, <laughs> once, Dixon? Once burned, twice learned. <laughs> For the differential, we would be entirely within our rights to direct you to the table of contents of parasitic diseases <laughs> six. But as loyal listeners, we will attempt to winnow out the three or four parasites. It couldn't be. The obvious helminthic suspects are the notorious Ascaris lumbricoides, hookworm, strongyloides, and schistosomes, all of which pass through the lungs as part of their life cycle and wreak havoc. Paragonimus lung flukes are also on the table. She could have picked up any of these beasties from the dirt water and animals around her. True, these are all usually cause other symptoms as well, but in a small child, who knows, who knows what will happen and what will be observed first? On the non-helminthic side, it could be Entamoeba histolytica, Balantidium coli, and Toxoplasma gondii, although the latter two are fairly unlikely to cause the described symptoms and nothing else. It could even be malaria, although it's not the stereotypic presentation. Since it's the end of the rainy season, malaria should be peaking and definitely a possibility, especially as malaria is more likely to present atypically in a child this young. Our knowledge of control foo fails us here as parasitic diseases has one result for tachycardia, which is a scorpion sting. The the thought of lung scorpions is alarming, but blessedly implausible. Control F lung brings up, as discussed earlier, the entire book. Well played, Daniel. (laughs) Control F (laughs) you. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) On the non-parasitic side, this little girl has lung crackles, fever, a fast heart rate, and a headache. Conclusion, she is sick. Tuberculosis, influenza, who knows? Whatever she has, the other kids visiting the clinic from a wide area have it too. We're expecting the result to be an infection of high incidence amongst children in impoverished communities in this part of Africa rather than an epidemic in the region of something unusual. That, of course, narrows it down to everything we've already suggested. But this is TWIP after all. Among the available tests, the malaria and TB ones are the most urgent. Rapid malaria test would be a good start as it's rapid. (laughs) If negative, microscopy could still be a good idea as it can be more sensitive as well as the the TB test. If we weren't limited to what was available, we would request stool O&P, a blood count, chest x-ray, and a whole wagon load of antibody tests. Mm. Given the non-specificity of the symptoms, it's hard to suggest a treatment If malaria tests positive, she should be treated with artemisinin-based combination therapy. If TB test is positive, an appropriate antibiotic. If neither, well, given the setting, it's very likely she has some infection, which could be treated with albendazole, even if the direct cause of these symptoms isn't. It would help with quite a few of the things on this list, so it's as good a stab in the dark as any. There is a reason we are not doctors. (laughs) (laughs) Well, if you had wanted to be, you would go to medical school and you'd be good at this. Not saying you're not good, but you know what I mean. For what it's worth, our money's on malaria, but in this case, it really is just a guess. We've won both books. We've both won books at this point, so either leave us out of the draw or donate it to a library if we win, not the formal way. Just leave it on a shelf or table. Perhaps (laughs) switch its dust jacket or Dewey (laughs) Decimal number with that of the Art of the Deal. (laughs) This comes from your favorite transatlantic temporarily parted partnership. It's hard to listen to TWIP with someone who's moved another three time zones away from you. Now back in action, Caitlin now of Seattle and Carrie of Nukes, Newcastle upon Tyne, England. Very interesting. Indeed. Did, did you guys want to discuss a little bit of the differential as, as the sort of they, th- this I thought was very nice. They did kind of go through the table of contents and, <laughs> and uh, discuss. <laughs> um, I thought it was nice. They brought up uh, the fact that some of our helmets have a, um, a pulmonary uh, part of their life cycle. I mentioned ascaris, hookworm, strongyloides, schistosomiasis. And actually some of us refer, Dixon, you may do this well, the, the fact that there are many helmets with the ascaris like um, life cycle. Yep. This is so true. It's <laughs> nice. Uh, and paragon- lots of animals. I mean, they didn't mention whether it could be Toxicara, Canis, or Cati, but it certainly would have fit some of the, the symptomatology, as they say, of that particular entity. But uh, we, we go on. I think Paragonimus was a bit of a reach. That's got to eat something like a 
crustacean mm-hmm. or freshwater mm-hmm. crustacean for that mm-hmm. one. So that probably wouldn't be running around their hut. Yeah, I probably wouldn't see such a high incidence. I sort of tried to give not a hint in everybody. That that's is true. Unless there was a, um, a a picnic that everybody was invited to. You know, but yeah, there's a Paragonimus <laughs> um, africanus, right? There's yep, the three. We have absolutely. the Kelicotti here in the U.S. Right. and and that's the people like to drink and float down rivers and and dare each other to eat raw crawfish. Exactly. There's the Western Mane in Southeast Asia. That's kind of the classic organism. Yeah. Uh, but there's also an Africanus in Africa. So you know, it's right. in the. I mean, it's there, but uh, you have to do something to catch it. And a four-year-old kid probably wouldn't. Yeah, I guess Entamoeba histolytica, you could potentially have a, a lesion in the lung there. You could. Um, but you, I guess thinking about 30 of those a day might be a little excessive. Yeah, that's right. Um, mm. I hope we're not seeing that much TB in this clinic. No. Otherwise, I'm in for a little bit of trouble. That'd be horrible. Um, but I, I like the I like the dust jacket suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Good. They make a good team, actually. <laughs> yeah. Thank. Thank yeah. you. That was an entertaining email. And I, they, you know, despite the frustration, they have a sense of humor and they tried it anyway. It's they good. do. And they, you know what? Uh, they ended up with something quite plausible. Well, they had a nice differential, and, and then you could then take that and say, okay, well, what tests do we have? What can right. we either confirm or rule out? So, yeah, exactly. that was good. Exactly. So the control F is is really interesting <laughs> because not only is it a, a search command, control F, but you can talk about your control foo, right? You know, your foo, your goodness at something, right? I guess. You get it? And if you can insult someone, control F U. I know. <laughs> <laughs> or you could become a con- you could be a Y-O-U, but it sounds like, yeah, you get it, right? They did a very good job with that. Dixon, can you take Ivan's email? I would love to. Ivan writes, dear DVD. Excellent. <laughs> calls Dixon, us Vincent by an expired Daniel. medium that doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> That's right. That's a doctor of veterinary diseases or something. <clears throat> In the last episode's case... We have seen that even the seemingly straightforward cases aren't necessarily so trivial, emphasizing the importance of precise diagnosis in order to provide the best treatment. This time, the case gives us a wider range of possible diagnoses, yet a much more limited diagnostic and therapeutic procedure for the MD in charge. I believe that the four-year-old kid is suffering from acute malaria. The fact that we are now in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, plus recent rainy periods, plus common presentation in other individuals, plus nonspecific signs of generalized infection, makes me comfortable to say that. Of the nine tests that Daniel's, Daniel listed, obviously the microsc- micro- microscopic examination of blood smear and a malaria rapid test come in handy. Since the signs started just a day ago, it is probable that the child is still early in the acute phase and that with proper medication, for example, artusinate, quinine, or quinidine, Complications like cerebral malaria could be prevented. I read somewhere on the net that up to 10% of deaths in African kids is attributed to malaria, and that's absolutely correct, unfortunately. Let me just correct me here for one mistake in my previous email. While taking while talking about therapy of mucocutaneous leishmaniasis, I wrote <clears throat> Vet Parasitology 6th Edition when I meant your parasitic diseases 6th edition, the book that you so kindly give away from now. Now for a while. It is just that I'm surrounded by so many vet books now preparing for the ECVP board exam. Actually, the only book that is not veterinary and is included in my study list is the Robbins and Cotron Pathologic Basis of Disease Professional Edition, Ninth Edition, a book that at least Daniel is surely familiar with. As a final remark, I just wanted to express my admiration for Daniel's volunteer work in Africa, and I'd like to second that too. And of course, in other less developed countries, a lot of times we, individuals living in the developed world, think of our lives as difficult and see our problems as big, yet we realize, rarely realize that there are so many people that indeed fight some real and uh, essential um, – Existential. Existential problems. That's real. Um, and people like Daniel make their lives – at least a little easier. Thank you, and I hope I didn't go too much out of track. P.S. Big like for the previous and current running habits. <laughs> Best, I, Ivan, from Sleepy Zagreb, which is in uh, Croatia, right? Croatia now. That's exactly correct. He's talking about Daniel's running habits, because I know you and I 
Dixon don't have any running. <laughs> I barely walk. <laughs> I run from predators. <laughs> Dinosaurs. Well, yeah, only... but Dix, Dixon is a prior marathoner, right? That's Once true. marathoner, always. Oh, a that's marathoner. true. He said the previous running habits. I used to run when I was a postdoc, yeah, yeah. and a and a graduate student. I I, jog, I ran for exercise, uh, but I stopped when I when I moved back to New York. The only time I run now is either when I have a cold or diarrhea. And I when I came to New York, I started riding my bike until I got hit in the park, and then I stopped by a by a rollerblader. Oh no! Oh my gosh! Oh wow! It knocked me over into horse shit. Oh my god! Which is covering the the roads in the summertime in the Yuck. park. So I had oh, I got all scraped up, and the horse shit was scraped into it. I ran home and took a shower for about an hour. <laughs> all right, hey, Daniel. Uh, sorry, gonna... I'm very sorry. <laughs> and now back to our regularly scheduled program. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes. I was going to say, I think I may have mentioned on a prior one, my my uh, story of the Robbins uh, pathological basis of disease. And this was, this was quite a while back. This was early 90s. And I spent about a month traveling around China, very distracted at times, going to different places. My original plan, I was going to head up. I was going to go across um, the Karakam Highway and and down into Islamabad, but next thing you know, I'm in Tibet. I'm I'm yeah doing all kinds of things. But what I brought with me, actually, uh, as absurd as this might seem, but I had a copy of the Robbins Pathological Basis of Disease textbook, which I had removed using a razor blade from the from the hardcover, <laughs> and then I had each chapter stapled. And as I would finish each chapter, that was the toilet paper that we were using. Ah, <laughs> so, what a great so, use. Wow. <laughs> so it was it prompted me to read, you know, quick enough to keep up with the needs of our small group. That's funny. I'm Plus, sure they you're lightening like your load, so to speak. <laughs> yes. And I was going to say, so uh, Ivan, if he's from Croatia, I noticed on our list, we don't have any books that we have yet to send to Croatia. So Ivan, if you hear this and you shoot an email to our Parasites Without Borders, maybe if we're feeling generous, we might send one to Croatia. Absolutely. Maybe know. he'll win. Think, maybe he'll win. Ivan, yeah. Ivan is in the running now because he, uh, I don't believe he's won. So we'll put a number next to Ivan. And Daniel, next. Anna writes, hello, doctors. Twip. I'm writing with both a case guess and a heroine. Feel free to use the attached short biography of Anne Bishop in full or paraphrase as you see fit. Bishop was something of a super heroine, and I'm excited to get to write about her and share her story. Also, it was a pleasure meeting Vincent while he was visiting Madison for his talk and live twiv. It is still only moderately cold here at about 22 degrees Fahrenheit, and the lakes still aren't completely frozen over. Thank you very much for speaking to us. I look forward to running into you again. Uh, I think I should say that in our next, uh, I guess, edition seven, Ann Bishop is one of our historical figures that is going to be featured. This is all true. Yeah. Here is my guess for the case of the Ugandan four-year-old. I believe this young child with a one day of fever, headache, and cough with a rapid heart rate and crackly lungs is suffering infection with ascaris lumbacoides. A pneumonia-like syndrome can develop during the early phase of the infection when the larva migrate into the lungs before being coughed up and swallowed back into the intestines. The sudden onset of the fever, cough, and rapid heart rate and the ill appearance of the child probably indicate the child was recently infected and thus the larvae have reached the lungs. The child might be experiencing Loeffler syndrome. Adult female ascaris worms can produce up to 200,000 very hardy eggs per day, <laughs> which exit the host in feces. So it is no wonder that there were many others from the area showing similar symptoms, especially given the child's stream swimming pastime or maybe just because kids play in dirt. I would imagine the rainy season helped wash eggs from the soil into the stream, resulting in widespread infection. For diagnosis, I would order a stool O&P to look for ascaris eggs, although I do not think there would be eggs in the feces yet as this stage of the worm's life cycle. So, if O&P was negative, I would use ultrasound to look for worms in the liver or pancreas or perhaps the lungs. I would treat this child and all the others similarly ill with a single dose of albendazole, or mobendazole, hopefully, with the rainy season ending, eggs remaining in the environment will have long exposure to sunlight, one of the few ways to destroy them. The parasitic differential for the case includes hookworms and strongyloides stercoralis, both of which can result in a pneumonia-like syndrome, and both 
which can be found in Uganda. Though, I believe the clinical picture and story fits better with Ascaris lumbricoides. The non-parasitic differential includes all the bacteria and viruses that can cause respiratory symptoms in young children. I spent a little time working in Uganda. A physician with whom I worked told me she avoided becoming ill from worms by taking a dose of albendazole every six months, and she encouraged me to do the same. Is this a practice Dr. Griffin follows on the completion of his trips? Thanks, as always, for your wonderful and informative podcast, Anna. Hmm. Okay. Dear. Daniel, can you do – do you see rhinoviruses in Uganda? Um. I, I would say sir. Cert- play on words. I, no, no, it wasn't. I'm actually, I'm actually interested. Although, are there rhinos in the Uganda? <laughs> there used to be. <laughs> I, I think I'm going to say yes to both of those. Okay. And and other common cold viruses, I presume. Do you see influenza in uh, c- cer- Certainly. And oh, I, think we, I think we talked at one point about, um, I was trying to do a study in Malawi, not very far away, um, using uh, one of these multiplex multiplex. Uh, respiratory uh, pathogen panels to characterize because you're you're seeing a lot of stuff, and without um, the diagnostics, it's quite hard to tell: is this a rhinovirus? Is this a coronavirus? A para influenza virus, etc. Mm-hmm. So okay, yeah, got it. Now, what about albendazole every six months? Do you do that? You know, I I don't. <laughs> you know, I don't I don't mind having worms. I'm you know I'm a pretty flexible guy. <laughs> And they don't but mind no, having I, you. <laughs> but what, but I, what, what is being brought up, and I think this makes a lot of sense, um, there are a lot of um, – and Peter Hotez, right, is a big champion of this kind of stuff, is um, there's a lot of programs where you try to do deworming programs. So rather than trying to diagnose um, everyone, a, a sort of assumption is that with the right exposures, there's going to be um, pretty broad helminth infections mm-hmm. with the uh, – the unholy trinity, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, so every three or six months, uh, people will do a single dose um, albendazole. And um, I think I mentioned with the floating doctors, that's part of their every three months when they go to these communities, they're um, distributing the single dose um, albendazole um, deworming uh, medications. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Kevin writes polyparasitism. In eastern Uganda, Bududa district, at the tail end of the rainy season, a four-year-old child with a day's worth of fever, cough, headache comes to a clinic where Dr. Griffin notes tachycardia and right lower lobe crackles on auscultation. For someone unfamiliar with tropical pediatrics, how can such nebulosities, such maddening generalities be made <laughs> clear? <laughs> Medicine though aspiring to be a science, usually turns out to be a series of sometimes miserable compromises. Their miserable crops up for the second time. It does. It does. <laughs> the confluence of incomplete information and poor or non-existent clinical histories, misleading symptoms, absence of proven therapies, false negative lab tests, cognitive biases, and many other deficiencies can occasionally turn medicine into a proverbial dog's breakfast. Fortunately, despair with a little massaging can be reformed into a path forward. Corny and fusty as it may seem, a review of Hippocrates' aphorism too might help. Quote, wherefore, respect must be had to the region, time, age, and diseases in which it is agreeable or not. End quote. Likelihoods in this case will guide us. According to Low Lavar 2016, the most common clinician assigned diagnoses for hospitalized Ugandan children age six months to five years old, included clinical malaria, 49.7%, pneumonia, 31.4%, mm-hmm. and gastroenteritis diarrhea, 78 In Uganda, malaria accounts for 30 to 50% of all outpatient visits, 35% of all hospital visits, and 9 to 14% of all hospital deaths, half of those being in children under five years of age. Yeah. Other factors. The region. Uganda has one of the highest entomological inoculation rates in the world meaning exposure to infectious mosquitoes. Right. The season, according to Yika 2012, malaria transmission does not have significant seasonal variation in Uganda. Contradicting this is Kamya 2015, who clearly notes peak malaria transmission following the two rainy seasons, March, May, and August, October, and states, we found highly seasonal transmission and varied relationships between measures of transmission, infection, and disease. 
The patient age, I age under five years, is a risk factor for severe malaria and mortality due to malaria. This vulnerability is in part due to inadequate protective immunity. Mm. The probability is that this child has falciparum malaria. The early presentation has a typical constellation of nonspecific symptoms. Pulmonary findings are common in malaria and can become quite marked in severe malaria. Dilemma here is deciding the child has concurrent pneumonia. Relevant references pertaining to malaria and pneumonia confection are in the endnotes. Available and relevant diagnostic tests in our case are blood smear and malaria molecular rapid test. Blood smear can occasionally be negative, so the availability of the rapid test is reassuring. Since urinalysis is available, this might be a value to check for bilirubin to assess hemolysis and specific gravity to assess hydration status. If the patient has not been HIV tested, this will have a future benefit and may also guide pneumonia therapy. I will not digress into the world of other co-infections, charmingly described as polyparasitism (laughs) in the Quan reference, but there are some interesting disease associations to consider. Likewise, co-infection with TB, HIV, childhood enanthems and exanthems and other respiratory viruses will be dispensed with in the interest of time. Treatment should be with artemisinin-based combination therapy. If the patient develops more severe symptoms, treatment with parenteral artesinate is recommended. If there is clinical suspicion of pneumonia, common culprit strep pneumonia and H. influenza, antibiotic therapy should be started in addition to ACT. Amoxicillin has been recommended by WHO. This case became much more dramatic for me when I saw the 2016 U5MR, under 5 mortality rate, the probability per 1,000 live births that a newborn will die before age five. For Uganda, five, 53 out of 1,000, versus the U.S., seven out of 1,000. Thanking TWIP educators and disease fighters. And I will add that uh, there is an extensive res- uh, list of references at the end, which are full of quotes, uh, which in some cases are illuminating and amusing at the same time. You should not miss it in the show notes, in the area where it says, letters read on TWIP, you click it, you will get this good stuff. Yes. Hmm. I think it's very interesting, and this is something the, Caitlin and, Caitlin and. Carrie. Carrie, thank you. Didn't do, they looked up what infects young kids the most in Uganda. That's what he did. And that steered him. Did. So in the future, folks, it might be something you want to do. Right. But remember, in Uganda, when you <laughs> hear the sound of hoofbeats, don't think of horses. Think of zebras. Well, I think of rhinos. <laughs> well, you, by the time you can hear those hoofbeats, it's too late. <laughs> they're, they're on you. Nixon, you can take the next one. I'm working towards it. I'm trying to find it first. Lisa. Mm-hmm. Lisa writes, hi, TWIP team. I'm a new TWIP listener in Atlanta, Georgia, where I'm finishing my MS in public health and hoping for microbiology PhD program acceptances. To diagnose this infection, I'd request a stool specimen and conduct a stool examination to look for my suspect, Ascaris lumbricoides. This soil-transmitted helminth, commonly known as roundworm, while often asymptomatic, is known to cause all of the mentioned symptoms, fever, headache, cough, tachycardia, and crackles, as well as myalgia, malaise, shortness of breath, wheezing, and chest pain. Of note, a stool examination will only yield eggs if the patient has been infected for a while, usually about 40 days. Excuse me. To treat Ascaris, I'd suggest mebendazole and or albendazole. Lastly, to toss some public health in here, Ascaris infects approximately 1.2 billion people around the world. It's susceptible to mass drug administration of albendazole, along with hookworm and whipworm, as well as improvements in water sanitation and hygiene. Cheers, Lisa. Hmm. Right. And that's it for our guesses. It is. I guess it's early in the semester and people are busy. <laughs> this is this is all true. By the way, I noticed that there had been a dramatic change in our own weather if you look out the window, but that's beside oh, the point. The, the weather, the storm has passed. It, it, apparently. Good. That means we won't get soaked when we go to I home guess later. Not. Very I guess good. not. So, okay. So, I guess Daniel wants to know what we think now. Certainly. I'm very <laughs> excited to hear what you think. Well, 
you know, uh, I, I, why don't you go first, Vincent? I can't because you oh. I, you walked in before and said it's malaria before I even did. Had I a did I say? But that doesn't mean you have to say that. You don't. Yeah, but I agree with you. You do okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I never had a chance to go through it. That's different. But um, all right, I, I find the statistics of Kevin really compelling. Yes, and I, I will be interested to hear what Daniel thinks about the malaria season uh, in Uganda. But uh, I, I'm just letting you talk about it. Why did you guess malaria, Dixon? Well, for the for, for the one thing, this is the age that is the most susceptible to the most severe symptoms mm-hmm. prior to the time when they age enough to develop their own mature um, immune system so they can start fighting this thing off. Since there are peaks of transmission in Uganda associated with the end of each of those mini uh, or large rainy seasons – uh, that's the time to look for this. And in Daniel's um, admission, that 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 were many people coming into the clinic with this same presentation. It's early onset acute malaria. It needs to be headed off at the pass, so to speak. You have to start treating immediately because it can really get out of control very fast. And these poor kids, their maternal antibodies have waned, and that's the reason why they're so susceptible to this infection. Before that, they were protected uh, for the other three seasons where they had to endure it. And so the, the, the tip off for me was end of rainy season, four year old kid comes into a clinic, headache, wheezing. Those are not typical symptoms for any parasitic disease except early onset malaria. And so that's, that's okay. basically the way I was trained to present that to medical students for 38 years. So <laughs> I'm sorry that I'm coming in with all this experience, but, but that's basically why I chose to, to side with that diagnosis. So I was curious about crackles. Yeah. And I looked them up. <clears throat> rails. It's it's also known as rails. Yes. Yeah, so, so you can actually find the Wikipedia page, and there's a little recording of crackles that you can listen to. Yeah. <laughs> since I've never heard crackles. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Daniel, can you imitate crackles? You can't do it. <laughs> Unless you have you know, it, you can't actually, do it. Actually, you guys could probably do it. One of the ways that uh, people might – it's hard for me because I'm a little short of hair. But um, <laughs> if you – maybe actually, Vincent, you could probably do it. If you put your head close to the microphone and then you take your fingers and take your hair and sort of bring it against – the the um, ah. The two types of sounds in general that you hear when you auscultate, when you listen to someone's lungs, are yes. con- continuous and discontinuous. Are, are you are you doing that with your hair right so now? So what do I do with my hair? Just rub so it? So you're going you're gonna to rub your hair, sort of take a handful of hair and crinkle it back and forth rub against it on the, the microphone. Uh, up in the front uh, let's, let's hear. I'm going to listen and see what this sounds like. Doesn't, it doesn't make any noise. <laughs> his, his hair is thinning. I must tell you that his hair is thin. Oh, shut up. <laughs> maybe it's, maybe it's too thin. But we talk and about mine is non existent. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> yeah, we talk about continuous and discontinuous. So the discontinuous, um, and, and Get you know, your beard. I, Get your beard. maybe rub your, but, but don't rub your hair against the microphone. Rub your hair against each other very close yeah, I did. to Yeah, that's did. what I did. did. Yeah. Um, didn't, didn't but there is, a, there is a, um, <laughs> There's a recording at Wikipedia. Let me play that for you and see if you can. Yeah, hear let's. That. And will this come across? Will our listeners be able to hear crackles? Hang on. Yeah, actually, that's good. I like that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a bubbling, gurgling type of noise. Yeah, it's the discontinuous, and then the ronchi or wheezes is a continuous sound, mm-hmm. which. Yeah, so we think about the crackles as coming from the smaller airspace um, disease, and then we think of the continuous, the ronchi, the wheezing coming from larger airways. And um, when you hear a localization like that, it, it's suggesting that we have a process that is giving us airspace disease. And we used to historically say, oh, airspace disease, low bar, pneumonia, it's got to be bacteria. But Actually, I have to say it's never really panned out, and most of the studies have showed that whether you get pneumonia from parainfluenza virus or influenza virus or uh, RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, or pneumococcus, so viral bacterial, can all uh, give us airspace disease. So the localization is suggesting that we have a process, viral or bacterial, giving us airspace disease, so pneumonia. Um but then the other diagnosis, and actually, why four? Um, and, and I think all of us in um, the parasitology field 
probably uh, think of this uh, this diagram where you see the incidence of a certain parasitic disease being not that high in the zero to three, but then having this real rise in the four to five, and then it sort of gradually tapers off. Do you know what kind of the figure I'm talking about, Dixon? Yes. And um, and that's what Dixon alluded to, is the first three years of life, you have a certain protection from this, in part because um, children are breastfed. I'll give you the uh, figure in the book. It's, it's under- Oh, it's in our book? It is. What an excellent book we must have. <laughs> but <laughs> No, I, I'm serious. We have this. Really. But so it's interesting. So when we say that there's, um, I have a page 111, um, and, and you, you can look, we should almost it like is. expand this. It's on page 111. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And you so can see there's there's not many little, deaths in the first year. When it's a little gap. Is. It's a little gap. It's also in one of your lectures, Dixon. Yeah. Well, that's that's where this came from. So when you stop breastfeeding, um, but before you've sort of reached the ability to generate um Premunition, right? Uh, we see a real peak in the um, in the malaria deaths. So, yeah. uh, so yes. Uh, and I, I, when I was giving my lecture in Glasgow, I like to Glasgow. I like to tell this story of you know the person comes in and they're all worried because they've got this rabid dog attached to their arm, but then they tell me they have a fever and headache and they just get back from the tropics and you know first thing I want to get is a blood smear for malaria. Um, so I always like malaria to be at the top of everyone's diagnosis. Um, you know check for malaria before worrying about anything else, if it's the tropics, if it's fever, if it's the rainy season. And as, um, who was it with this just enormous number of references here? Kevin. (laughs) Kevin. (laughs) As Kevin Kevin points out, that's that's really going to be your number one cause of death in your um, children under five in Uganda. Uh, So one of the first things you want to do is you want to look for malaria. So, so let's, let's, take that next step. We go ahead and um, we send this child to the lab. They do a smear and the RBCs, red blood cells, are just chock full of parasites, um, significant percent. Uh, But what do we do with the fact that they also have this this localized region of crackles? Can you you get two things? Um, Could. You could. And actually, I always try to point out Occam was not a physician. No. Um, <laughs> and a razor blade has two sharp edges, by the way. So <laughs> no, Sometimes yep. they have four nowadays. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was thinking about that expression. People talk about a double-edged sword. Aren't, aren't a lot of swords double-edged? But uh, <laughs> Yes. Not all. <laughs> so um, about 10 to 20 percent of people with um, – Malaria also will have uh, a, a confirmable uh, bacterial infection. Interesting. And so this child, um, in my mind, had um, smear confirmed uh, malaria, yeah. uh, but also as uh, suggested, WHO recommendations, was also treated with amoxicillin with concern that there was a pneumonia as well. So you, you don't think the crackles were caused by malaria? I don't think the localized crackles were caused just uh, by malaria, which is why we also covered for a bacterial pneumonia. So you think H and H flu would be a possibility here? I think H flu is a is a possibility, but I'd say pneumococcus would be the the number one overwhelming in this age population. Got it. Um, but I have actually seen some pretty pretty sick blood culture confirmed H flu, um, and that is a bacteria, right? People think oh sure, but it's. Homophilus influenza. I actually have a patient Whooping. right here in the hospital with homophilus influenza right now. The, the anti-vaxxers' children are coming down with this. Well, so so pertussis, right? That would yeah. be whooping cough would be right. Um, That's right. bordetella. Yep. Um, I'm sorry. That's right. That's yeah, right. So, Absolutely. Um, but yeah, so I, I think a couple of nice things I like about people that wrote in is, is they, you know, you start with your broad differential because if you don't consider it, it's very hard to test for it and, and figure it out. Um, do, does this child also have ascaris and hookworms? Probably. Sure. Yes, I would say. But that's a background. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's a background thing probably going on. Yeah. Um, but I think the acute uh, situation here was uh, – malaria because of the mosquitoes and then um, also had a secondary uh, pneumonia as well. How did you treat for the malaria again? Uh, So the malaria in this case we did uh, the let's find if someone mentions but it was an artemisin based um, therapy. Artesanate. Artesanate based therapy. And we actually gave this child because they were pretty sick we gave them um, an IM 
on I, IV artesanate first, yeah. and then started them on oral as they as they improved. Right. And you were not there long enough to follow up, right? I was actually. So yeah, here here I see it. Art, artemisin based combination therapy. So is. yeah, as as A-C-T. suggested, we did a A-C-T. parenteral artesanate first, um, and then we actually then started them on an oral. Um, combination and no they i was there long enough this was uh, one of the first two days this case mm. and uh then they did well and and sometimes what would happen is if a child was not doing well we ended up spending sending a couple children to the local hospital who were just not doing um, particularly well so in this case the crackles were gone uh the crackles resolved the patient did well but you look did you do another blood smear no we didn't we didn't so i'm curious Daniel, as if you had stayed long enough to actually stay for like a month or two months, mm-hmm. uh, that's still during the high transmission season. Uh, would this child reacquire malaria through another mosquito bite? Uh, they're definitely at risk, um, and uh, that's one of the tough things. You can end up with malaria more more than once during the season, right? Particularly this young age. So exactly. So until they're five or six years old, six or seven years old. You know, the mortality rate is based on infant mortality. And if it was said once to me by someone who'd spent lots of time in Africa that if you live past the age of 10, you're probably going to live to the average age of what the rest of the world lives at. But living to the age of 10 is the trick. You know, a- I, I, that's interesting. At uh, at this uh, course, this uh, diploma in tropical medicine in Glasgow, there was a uh, an individual who was doing a talk on um, – I guess sort of the economics of medicine, you know, you're making choices right. about, you know, limited resources. And, and they showed a, uh, two diagrams and one was the, um, the, the age of different individuals and how many individuals at a certain age, uh, going up to 95 in Nigeria. And then they showed actually the same for <laughs> Scotland. Oh, right. You know, and one of the persons said, you know, Oh, look, people live longer in Scotland. He's like, actually, there, no, there's 95 year olds in Nigeria also. Exact. And so, but one of the issues is this bottleneck at below 10 is yeah. how many people can yeah. make it past that age. That's right. That's right. That's the sad part is to realize how privileged we are without really deeply appreciating that. And someone actually wrote about that in their response too. So, mm-hmm. hmm. Shall we give away a book? Let's do that. We have three people to consider. For we this. do. And by the way, yes. I, I'm out of signed books. So we, you guys need oh, to sign more. My goodness. Next time uh, Daniel is here. Yeah. Which I hope will be soon after I get back from my trip that I'm about to go on. All right. So where where are you going? Where I'm going, going off to, to Lyon, France. Okay. All right. We have three people. We're going to pick a number between one and three. The number is three. So our Lisa. winner is Lisa, the new listener. Yep. So Lisa, just send me your address, twip at microbe.tv. We shall mail you a copy of Parasitic Diseases, sixth edition. Excellent. Should you wish to have it, of course. Right. <laughs> Right. Not sure. You let us know. Twip at microbe.tv. Sure. Congratulations, Lisa. Yep. Way to go. Because when there are three people vying, the chances are much greater, aren't they? Well, absolutely. 33.3%. It's, like, it's, like it's like one in three. <laughs> three. I think. It's very good. <laughs> you got it. It's gr- you know, the quantitation here is astounding. <laughs> yes. We're just whizzes of the mathematics we are. and the statistics. We are. Now we have a paper. We do which uh, was selected by Daniel. It is published in Frontiers in Microbiology. Mm -hmm. It's called Extracellular Vesicles Released by Leishmania Amazonensis Promote Disease Progression and Induce the Production of Different Cytokines in Macrophages and B1 Cells. This comes from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Right. And the first author is Fernanda Marins Costa Barbosa, and the last author is Patricia Zander. Daniel, what caught your eye about this paper? Was it the B1 cells, which I know you like very much? <laughs> I, I have. To, that's what caught my eye, and what kept my attention was the extracellular vesicles. And we'll we'll see if this ends up being a theme. I have another paper that I uh, just ran across yesterday that we'll we'll see if it meets approval of you two guys. Uh, have we talked about extracellular vesicles before? I don't. Twip? I don't. I don't think we have. I, I know we've talked about B one cells before, but have we extracellular vesicles? Is no, that new to this audience? Do you know? 
Don't know. No, but you know, on Twiv, <laughs> we had a recent paper of, of mini circles of RNAs, which sounds a little bit like this, only it's intracellular. It's not extracellular, but it sounds like it's just a, an extra product thrown off by the organism, or I, I don't think viruses are organisms, but some <laughs> some non-coding region. Yeah, we did. We talked about exosomes. We did. Sure. We did. We did. And this is... This is sort of like the eukaryote equivalent, almost. Hey, trip 130. Yeah. We explain how secretion of extracellular vesicles influences the social motility of trypanosoma brucei. Look at that. The oh, social yes. motility. Yes. Okay, so we have uh, talked about EVs. Right. And so they will not, it will not be unknown to most listeners that these are vesicles released from cells they contain various things, and by things I'm being so precise. You are. <laughs> proteins. You know, some people say proteins. Really? They try and be- Proteins? Yeah, there's some Isn't people that a Greek god of some proteins. sort? Proteins. <laughs> Richard Axel says protein. Oh, come on. Proteins, glycogen, conjugates, RNA, DNA, lipids, metabolites. They're like everything. Yeah, a lot of stuff. Things. Except money. No money. <laughs> no money. <laughs> <laughs> they go from cell to cell. That's cell amazing. can release them, and a recipient cell can pick it up. It can have effects on the recipient cell. It can cause communication. It can cross species. Can it? Do you think it can transfect another organism? Yeah, of course. It could deliver DNA. It's a and lateral it can, transfer. It can result in lateral gene That's transfer. That's amazing. Right? Yeah, it's pretty cool, and we didn't know about these all that long ago, right? Wow. And there is a metabolic price to pay for this, so it must have some selective advantage. Everything has a metabolic price. <laughs> Everything. You always have to weigh the cost of whatever it is that you're doing. So, Daniel, what's, this, what's the backstory here? What are we doing? Well, as, as we've talked about with the different uh, Leishmania species, there's a whole interaction between different Leishmania species and the host response and the ultimate disease manifestations that we that we see. And I think we talked uh, – well, I don't think I know <laughs> that <laughs> on the last episode we talked about that poor individual from the border of Panama and Costa Rica who came yeah. in with a mucocutaneous – Leishmaniasis, our surfer. That's right. Um, and I, I, Dixon and I were talking a little bit um, off off show. Every so often, he and I uh, have a relationship that does not occur while being while recording TWIP. This is true. And uh, I'd given him an update where um, we had talked to our we had talked on the show about we'd done a biopsy when the the man's disease had not improved as much as I would have liked, and that had shown uh, the squamous cell cancer at the edge of. Uh, the disturbed area. It also showed the Leishmania parasites, which we were hoping, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed, I, I was saying the other day, is we cross our fingers when we're either hopeful or lying. I'm not sure why, why it, for both. But uh, you could see the Leishmania parasites and the cancer in the same um, pathology specimen. That's amazing. So um, it's interesting that the Leishmania parasites can affect uh, and induce a certain degree of inflammation, uh, sometimes to their advantage, sometimes to their disadvantage. But here we're seeing a modulation of the immune system. We always think of macrophages, but now they're introducing into the paradigm B1 cells and actually claiming that the impact on B1 cells may actually be um, – important in the disease uh, manifestation and the number of parasites um, and the success of the parasites. So, Right. A B1 cell, a kind of different kind Sounds of Sounds like cell. a bomber. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, let's, let's, let's remind again our listeners about what B1 cells are. And so in the, in the immune system, you have a bunch of different types of cells. And the, the two main types of lymphocytes are our T cells and our B cells. And our T cells, we broadly break it down into our CD4 positive and our CD8 positive. The CD4s are, we like to think of those sort of coordinating um, helper cells that coordinate the other ones. And those are the ones that are particularly targeted by HIV. And then in the B cell world, we have our B1 and our B2 cells. Uh, B2 cells are the ones that when you give someone a vaccination, they'll make antibodies. And the B1 cells are the uh, the ones that came first, we think, both in evolution and also come first in um, embryology. And they're the first wave of B cells. And these are, these are 
I like to sort of our superhero type B cells. They they can function both as antibody producers, but they're producing a natural antibody, an antibody that is defined and selected by evolution and very similar to the germline. Um, but they also have the ability to function as phagocytes. They can actually um, phagocytize as well. Wow. So this is L. amazonensis, and they're looking at vesicle release from promastigotes. Yeah, promastigotes. Let's talk about that for a minute. What's a promastigote? So this is the stage of the infection that takes place inside the uh, sandfly. Hmm. All right? So that's why they had these various temperatures that they were growing them at to see when the vesicles were released. Or I see. So they they had to, first of all, match the environment of the insect, which is Mm -hmm. – basically ambient temperature. In this case, it was like 26 degrees, as I recall. And then they had a few other temperatures, and they, they ramped it up to 37, which is the temperature of the host. And uh, the parasite was much more efficient at throwing off vesicles while it was still in the sand fly. Mm. But remember, they're going to use these vesicles for lots of things, including modulating the host immune response. So this is preemptive on the part of the parasite because it knows very soon – if the sandfly does its job, it's going to be inside of a mammalian host, and it should be ready to go in with the maximum amount of armamentarium. Mm. And that's what these vesicles, some of them at least, uh, turn out to be. Right, Daniel? So Yes. So the, so the promastigote transforms to an amastigote the moment it's injected by the sandfly into the uh, skin, and it's picked up. By, let's say a dendritic cell or a macrophage or a histiocyte or lots of other names for cells that phagocytize. And the parasite, once it gets inside that cell, it drops its flagellum and it rounds up and, and it starts to reproduce as an amastigote. And I don't think those actually throw off vesicles, but we're not sure because we don't have a really good way of isolating the parasite away from the cytoplasm to see whether or not it's, you know, producing these microvesicles. But certainly the promastigote is, and it brings it in with it to the milieu of the host. And that that's what this paper is, that they induce uh, very interesting uh, patterns of, cytoc- of, of, of uh, interleukins, rather. So they start by showing that these <clears throat> the EVs are released by promastigotes, they're released over time. And you can grow them in vitro, by the way. So they're, 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 they're yeah. quite easy to handle in this case. And you yeah. kind of know your, they've, your, they've also found them in mice, but they, they purify right. they can purify the vesicles. Yes. And then do experiments with them. They use a cephidex column to Use a column to them. purify it. <laughs> and um, then they do these experiments where they add these extracellular vesicles. In one, they have bone marrow-derived macrophages. Right. And they say... The, the addition of EVs increases cytokine production. Yeah, but specific kinds. And though, it's right? temperature dependent. Right. So IL-6 increases yes. in macrophages stimulated with vesicles obtained at 26, 34, and 37 degrees. Right. But IL-10 only is induced only in cells stimulated with parasites, EVs, incubated at 26 and 34 degrees. Right. And you're saying this has something to do with the vector. It might, but it, it might. also has something to do with the temperature of the skin because the skin is much cooler than mm. the rest of the body, right? So it's 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 still valid to think of this as a host uh, invasion factor. And IL-10, I tried to look this thing up because I, I tend to forget these Another, functions. <laughs> there's that word again, this thing. <laughs> right. And it turns out that IL-10 has multiple functions. Mm-hmm. It's not just a single thing that it does. It does multiple things depending on the circumstances. So, Daniel, I think at this point you better take over because I'm out of information at this point. No, no, this that, that's, okay. that's okay. And, I, I, you know, the two figures that are, I thought were really important before we get to, I think, um, figure eight were figure six and figure seven. So they're, they're looking at um, cytokine. Um, response, so either at the uh, the PCR level, right? So you're making the RNA, or what I think is really more important, I'm going to say, is when they go to Figure Seven, they're actually doing ELISAs and they're looking for right. the, the protein production. Right. And actually, the results are a little bit different. Uh, so I, I sort of took my Figure Seven and I divided it in half. On the left side are your bone marrow derived macrophages, on the right are your B1 cells, and then they're looking at IL6, they're looking at IL10, and they're looking at TNF. Alpha. Now we think of IL-10 as um, 
either immunosuppressive or sometimes we think of it as, as more of a Th2 type shift. And what they're really showing here is that um, while the, um, the cytokine production in the bone marrow drive macrophages uh, goes up for IL-10, when you look at the impact um, compared to control, the IL-10 just drops in the B1 cells. And so I thought that was quite dramatic. And so, yeah, as you were sort of asking, like, well, what is the role of IL-10? Um, it can either sort of calm down the degree of inflammation um, or it can actually um, shift the profile of the immune response from Th1 to Th2. Which is more of an antibody response than an, an inflammation response. Exactly. So what you're seeing yeah. here, and yeah. I, I think what they're sort of suggesting is that the impact of these um, microvesicles on the B1 cells is to really shut down their IL-10 production. Right. And B1 cells, um, Tom Tedder down at Duke is a big uh, uh, sort of person in this field. They're felt to be this B regulatory um, phenotype. Hmm. And when you shut down the IL-10, what you're doing is you're shutting down the B regulatory cells. You're preventing them from keeping things calm and you end up inducing inflammation. And then you would assume, as we see in figure eight, what happens is that in this inflammatory milieu, the parasites can really proliferate and the parasite burden does shoot up significantly. So this is a way for the parasite to attract new host cells to the area. Mm -hmm. That's as, we've, we've gone through this before in several other instances. That's the idea here, yeah. So Just dampening inflammation and attracting the cells it would like to replicate in. It's yeah. fantastic. So the, the, the second part of these experiments, they inject mice with either parasite alone or parasite plus extracellular vesicles, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And right. putting in the EVs enhances lesion formation and increases parasite burden. Exactly. And then in mice, you can also look at the cytokine profile. Yeah. So uh, parasites alone, you get an increase in IL-10, 4, gamma, interferon gamma, and TNF-alpha. Right. Parasites plus extracellular vesicles, you get a big, bigger increase, IL-10, IL-4, and TNF-alpha. Right. Now, we used two different strains of inbred mice, but uh, they don't really talk much about what would happen in people. And I think their cytokine patterns will be different, um, although the result is the same. You get these ulcerative lesions, the, the crataform lesions, um, which leave ugly scars. Basically, that's what this parasite does. And it has its way with us, so to speak, uh, during that time. The interesting part I find always about this is that it's a big open lesion, but it's sterile. Mm -hmm. There's no bacteria growing in it. The parasite has got some way of excluding superinfection to keep all the cells for itself. And the parasite is found only at the margin, the living edge of that margin. And indeed, that's where the sandflies usually bite when they pick up the parasites for the next round of uh, infection. So the, the IL-6 stimulates phagocyte recruitment. There you go. IL-10 deactivates the microbicidal effects of the recruited cells. It's, it's you know... It's like they uh, sat down in a game room before the big game, and they said, "Okay, now you're going to block so and so, and then you, and if you do that, then we can have, you know, it's it's really sounds um, particularly the B1 cells premeditated. It sounds B1 cells yeah. are the ones making the IL-10, and that there it's decreased. So, and you're going to say, well, you know, this happened over time, and it was by natural selection, and the ones yes, that of course, to do this. Of I'm course. going, I'm going with that approach. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would. I'm reading a book about ultimately do that. <laughs> I'm reading a book about the evolution of the eye. Really, it's just amazing. It's the same thing. I mean, you could say, oh, how could an eye evolve? Right, right. Small steps, <laughs> many times too, and not it has just... more, more than once. But that's right. It evolved a long time ago in cyanobacteria in their in their um, chloroplasts. Right. Does it say which organism on Earth had the largest eye of all? <laughs> no. no Who's the, the largest eye? The, it was an ichthyosaur. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I just saw that on a David Attenborough presentation. Well, so th I mean, that's the point I, here is that evolution, big... sometimes uh, you can't see the path of evolution, right? No. But it's there. You know, I read something, the same book, they say evolution is a historical science. It happened. Exactly. And so you really cannot reproduce it. 
you can't hope to experimentally reproduce it. You know, we do experiments to, to test various things, but you can't do that with it. You could figure out the the rules maybe, but you can't reproduce but it. But you can take advantage of it. You might be able to, yes. Sure. So here, this has evolved over time to a f- point where, you know, one day a parasite showed up with some <laughs> mutation that made a little bit more exactly. extracellular vesicles and put different things, you know, and it slowly uh, gets selected for. Sure. I have Absolutely. It's no problem at all. Nope. And don't discount the role of horizontal gene transfer. <laughs> it's Amazing. Not just, it's, which, you know, Dar- Darwin said mutation although he didn't know what mutation was. But no. included in that, you have to have horizontal gene transfer yeah, to acquiring new sequences by what you would call transfection. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so their last sentence is very interesting. Understanding the escape mechanisms used by L. amazonensis may contribute to the identification of new molecular targets and the development of new therapeutic approaches. Right. It's always the idea, isn't it? So we're trying to interfere <laughs> with evolution, basically, by we have already using medicines to. Oh, well, we thwart. have been for years. We keep people oh, healthy who would have died long ago. Yeah, but what is the result of it? Oh, well, our dean has written a book about that. <laughs> the organism eventually learns to evolve around that one too. Well, you can yeah. by selection. Well, we and, have antimicrobial resistance, and now you've right? got resistance. That's sure, right. that's right. So, we're we're playing with fire, Dixon. We used to hear at the annual meetings for tropical medicine and hygiene that the best way to avoid a tropical disease is not to live in the tropics. <laughs> you know, you know not that the, you um, be careful in the tropics, but uh, these EVs are very interesting. They are the you know the placenta is quite resistant to infection, and one of the reasons is they cells produce lots of extracellular vesicles which contain anti antiviral wow micro rnas wow it's really interesting it's all interesting isn't that how nerves transmit their signals to each other yeah, through the sy- synapse yeah, the synapse, little packets right exactly right little packets yep. science is amazing it is daniel what else would you like to say about this no i i think that that sums it up a bit i think that this is fascinating what what I guess I'll take just a one step further is, you know, do we care about leishmaniasis? Uh, like, what are, <laughs> and I and I think we do. And, oh yes. Um, you know, I hope people aren't misled when they read our book and they say, oh, here's the list of all the leishmania species to worry about because we're act- actively discovering new species, and we're also actively identifying. Um, situations where we didn't even realize leishmaniasis was causing disease, uh, right. particularly in areas of Southeast Asia. So um, I think leishmaniasis is a major issue throughout the world and maybe even slightly more of an issue than we previously realized. Yeah, And of course, this work comes out of Brazil, where yes. it's a problem, right? They have a lot of problems there. And this is one of them. <laughs> no, that's not, I don't want you to say that. <laughs> no, their biggest problem is their... Uh, well, I'd say leash, leash, <laughs> leash mania brasiliensis is the major uh, mucocutaneous uh, form. Um, Amazonensis, I think we comment, is maybe 1% or less will go on to mucocutaneous, but um, it, it has been described. Uh, but it's still, it's the, the fourth of the, I like to say the fourth of the three <laughs> that cause mucocutaneous <laughs> disease. Right. <laughs> yes. All right. Dear, dear. Next up is a hero or heroine. You promised a heroine last time, you know. Well, here it is. Oh, really? Amazing. It says, <laughs> right here, it says, hero, consider Marietta Vosges, sent by John Shea. Marietta, I knew Marietta Vosges. She was um, a wonderful teacher at UCLA. She um, studied tapeworms for a living. And uh, she wrote a book uh, along with Edward Markell. Uh, on parasitic diseases, and it was used for many years in many medical schools. And uh, so she was a microbiologist and an immunologist. Uh, and so I will just read what um, John Shea sent us. Uh, in July of 1984, the UCLA School of Medicine lost a great scholar, teacher, and friend with the passing of Dr. Marietta Vosges. She had sent, spent almost her entire academic career on the faculty of the medical school, first in the Department of Infectious Diseases, and then the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. During her tenure, she and her colleagues developed one of the most innovative and comprehensive curricula in medical parasitology for students of medicine. The textbook that she wrote with her friend and colleague, Edward Markle, is presently in its sixth edition and is considered among the very best 
text for students of medicine. Vosges served as the major professor for many graduate students and postdoctoral fellows from all points of the globe. She precepted medical students who would eventually apply their knowledge in laboratory parasitology to clinical practice, public health, and world health. She spent much of her own vacation time working in developing countries, refugee camps in Central America, and isolated mission clinics. Above all, Marietta Vosges was a great teacher. She was a creative educator who taught by example. She had scientific honesty, high standards of behavior towards colleagues and students, and she never put her name on a piece of work unless she had participated actively in the project. In her presidential address to the American Society of Parasitologists, she wrote, It is the teacher that sparks and stimulates the minds of students to produce new ideas. It is the teacher who gives the impetus to students to become the most important propellant to our society and civilization, the innovator, because without innovation and originality, society becomes stagnant and decadent. A superior teacher is the interpreter and keeper of our past, the critic of our present, the dreamer of things to come. End quote. Dr. Marietta Vosges was all of these things and much more. Hmm. Teachers are important, aren't they, Dixon? They are. And this uh, essay was composed of uh, by three different people, Larry Simpson, Gerald Turner, and James Seidel. And I'm, I was at one time a very close friend of Larry's. Uh, we have drifted apart by distance only. And um, <laughs> uh, he had a deep respect for the field of parasitic diseases and worked uh, his most of his whole life on trypanosomes. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. All right, now we have a new case. Not again. Where are we going, Daniel? Again, again. Well, I was going to say, actually, thank you for the people that put together this um, Yes. This little piece on Marietta Volk. Um, okay, we are, we're still in Uganda. <laughs> we have okay, not- okay. And uh, I, I thought this case was really interesting. And part of what made it interesting was this was a young boy who had come from um, quite a distance to, to see me. This was the second week I was there. Um, so he had come um, to Baduda from an area northeast. It had taken him quite a while to get to us. And this was a teenage boy. And his chief complaint when he came to see me was a large swelling in his scrotum. And it was on the left side of his scrotum. And by large, um, you know, we tend to like to use fruit analogies, right? But I'm going to actually stick to sonometers. And I'm going to say he had a swelling that was about four to six sonometers in diameter. It was on the left side of the scrotum. It was actually on exam superior to the testicle. Uh, He gave us a little more information when I asked him, sort of pointed questioning. He said that he was not the only young man in the area where he was from, and he knew other young men who had also had similar um, problems, and they had gone to surgeons to have these addressed. Um, I asked a little bit more about the area he was from, and and I asked a pointed question, which uh, hopefully will steer our listeners towards the diagnosis. I said, in the area where you live, um, are there people who have large swollen legs? And uh, he said, you know, yes, actually. Uh, Particular, I I should mention that my brother's wife, her, her left leg is large, swollen, and has kind of sort of an irregularity to it. And uh, he's coming to us and saying, um, can you fix this, this problem that I have with my scrotum? And, and I should throw it as a sort of um, later, later in the week, right? It's getting towards the end of the second week. Uh, there was the richest man in Baduda and he came and uh, it was about 7 p.m. I thought I was sort of done with the day and I was uh, sitting down to some, some noodles and uh he he wanted me to see one of his sons. Now, in this part of Uganda, uh, the men will often have multiple wives, many sons, and so again, this is a this is a boy that he had brought from from uh, an area northeast uh, to see me, and uh, they they said this man was the richest man in town. He owned a car. And I claimed I was the richest man in town because I own two cars. But <laughs> he wanted me to see his one of his sons, who also was a teacher, who had a very similar problem, a very large uh, six centimeter or so um, 
lesion in his scrotum. It's big. Yeah, I think. This is a separate entity within the scrotum. It's within the scrotum. And, and when you do exam, it is, it is just right above the testicle on the left side in this young man that we're talking is about. Is it attached in some way to the testicle? Um, you can you can move the testicle a little bit, but you can't move the testicle far away from this. It's um, testicles that are just inferior. It's non-tender. It doesn't hurt. Mm-hmm. It's it's not red. It's not hot. Um, and uh, what you can do too, if you so choose, which I so chose, um, if you have a bright flashlight, you can trans illuminate this, and it actually it sort of glows. Mm. Maybe people have a sense of what that means. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can be transilluminated. Right. And it maybe glows. that maybe that will illuminate our our mm, shed emails. new light is, uh, on that, side. that shed, yes, it'll shed light on this. And everything else on this young man it seems normal. Yeah, and and I will say and this was something interesting the the nurse that I was seeing this patient with and I mentioned before that there were um there were several nurses who were actually were the primary care physicians when I was not there and so I would see patients with them they for the one nurse though it was in the um the electronic medical record as a as a diagnosis you could choose uh she was not familiar with it because this is not something that they see right in the area where I was working um on a regular basis though I will suggest that um in the past, this had been a problem in that area as well. And this uh, young man, what does he do on a daily basis? Um, he he works um, up in that area, helps out in the fields, helps out take care of the animals. And so he's from a rural area. He's not from the city or anything. Mm-hmm. And he works outside. He works outside. And his home is mud floor. Mud floor, thatched roofs. Thatched roof. um, Small town, you know, up a dirt road, that sort of a thing. Lots of mosquitoes. Lots of mosquitoes, yeah. Lots of mosquitoes, yes. Okay. And he doesn't have any apparent mosquito bites when you see him, right? (laughs) You'd never see them. It's the the end of the rainy season. No, no, no. They become allergic to them after a while. You don't see them. They don't see them at all. They don't get. You don't don't get No, nothing. They have so many. That's right. Wow. Okay. Very good. That's that's good, right, Dixon? It's excellent. It's excellent, excellent. All right. Well, let's read a couple of emails. We we have uh, well, we only have one, <laughs> we only so let's read it. <laughs> okay, fine. It's from Anthony, and I think he, he quotes us on TWIP one sixty two. We said over half the animals are parasites. Did we say that? I said that. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds I'll like take, a Dixon. I'll take that sounds like a Dixon quotation. At least I said at least half of the animals are parasites, but I over I said over half. He wrote there was one species, humans, that hosts how many parasites? Hundreds? Presumably we're not yeah. more infestation prone, just better study than other animals. If that's so, then it's not just over half, but the vast majority of animals that are parasites. Yeah. yeah. Is that right? Well, if you're going to use the human host as the example, the answer is yes. But I, I think there are lots of other animals and plants that uh, don't have as many varieties of parasites as humans. That's what I think. Really think so? Yeah. Why do we have so many? Because uh, we're smarter? No, because we <laughs> live everywhere and we drink everything and we eat everything. And that's the reason. And animals are restricted. They are. Mm-hmm. They are. But not not birds. They can fly long distances. Yeah, that's right. Um, I participated one summer in a very interesting uh, summer. It was between my uh, master's degree and my PhD degree. And we went up to a biological station in Michigan at the University of Michigan's biological station in mm-hmm. Pelston. Mm-hmm. And we, I, took a, I took two courses. One was a protozoa, protozoology course, and the other was a, a helminthology course. Mm. And for the helminthology course, we would bring in roadkill, and we would dissect them. And uh, occasionally, some of the collectors out there that were doing ecological studies on frogs or fish, they would bring in some specimens for us as well. And I was absolutely amazed at the the lack of parasite diversity in birds, particularly crows. Hmm. We had lots of crows to dissect. It was very hard to find a parasite in them. And I think we were told the reason was because when crows uh, are f- found alongside the road and you see them eating on a carcass, 
They're not actually eating the meat of the carcass. They're picking out the contents of the stomach of the killed Mm -hmm. raccoon or, you know, possum or something like that, a skunk. So they avoid all of these parasites by simply, um, I think, by selecting their meals in a way that would uh, uh, not favor the transmission Mm -hmm. of at least Mm soil-based nematodes, that sort of thing. So, you know, just based on that assumption, I, I well, at least half of every group of animals and plants are parasitic. <laughs> but many more. I, I think there are many more than half, to, uh, to be honest. Okay. All right. Speaking of more than half, we're at TWIP 165. <laughs> we are. I don't know halfway to what, but. Right. You can pick a point. You can find it anywhere finer podcasts are distributed. And if you listen on a podcast player, please subscribe to TWIP so that we can see how many people are listening and that can help us to pursue uh, support opportunities. And if you'd like to support us yourselves, go to microbe.tv slash contribute and you could find there several ways to help us out on Patreon or PayPal and, and some other things as well. And if you would like to participate in the case Studies twip at microbe.tv, or if you just want to say hello and tell us what you're up to, you could send us an email. We'll read it on the show, and we'll chat about it. Right, Dixon and Daniel? Absolutely. Yes, certainly. You can find Daniel at Columbia University Irving Medical Center and at parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you, Daniel. A pleasure as always. When's your next trip? Uh, Panama's the next one. That's uh, coming up in March. Right. Right. Dixon de Pommiers at trichinella.org and thelivingriver.org. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. When's your next trip? Tomorrow. <laughs> bon voyage. Right. Where are you going to France? We're going to go to France. Yeah, we're going to Lyon first and then to Paris and then back home. I understand the population has the highest percentage of toxoplasma infection in the world in that country. It is, actually. Mm. You're right. I remember what you say here on Twitter. <laughs> anyway, some of it. It's about an 85% positivity by the age of 20. Are you going to pick some up? I th- No, I don't want to do that, actually. I'm not a fan of steak tartare, and I think that's how they uh, can. Mm-hmm. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music on TWIP is by Ronald Jenkins. Thanks to Ronald, and thanks to ASM for their support. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIP. Is, is parasitic. parasitic.